We are in the very last moments of 2020. And for most of us, we would say, I can't wait for this year to be over. It wasn't what we expected as I was here with you last year at this same time going into 2020 as we talked about the 2020 vision. A lot of things that were unexpected took place. But as we step into 2021, there is still much uncertainty about the future. For some, there's uncertainty about our jobs or our businesses. For others, there's uncertainty about our bank accounts or our financial security or our retirements. How am I going to pay the bills? There's uncertainty of the direction of the future of our country and the direction our country will go politically. There's uncertainty of what will even happen with the presidential election. There's uncertainty for maybe some newly drafted in homeschool parents who never thought they would ever homeschool but have now been drafted and appointed to be homeschool parents. And the uncertainty of, will my kids learn anything? The uncertainty of, I wonder if I can get through another day without committing murder. I read one mom who wrote this, it's day two of homeschooling my two kids and already one is suspended and the other is expelled. There's all sorts of uncertainty, isn't there? There's uncertainty of how long this pandemic will last and what life will be like when it's over. And maybe the scariest of it all, the uncertainty if grocery stores will ever, ever carry your brand of toilet paper again. There's all kinds of uncertainty we are facing and we as human beings don't do very well with uncertainty because with uncertainty comes the fear of the unknown. Psychologists and sociologists actually have discovered how the fear of the unknown is the fundamental fear of all other fears. Literally, the fear of the unknown is the one fear to rule them all. In other words, all phobias or fears that people have stem from the fear of the unknown. And what takes place often in uncertainty is that the fear of the unknown creeps into our lives and we as Christians can become paralyzed in fear and no longer walking the life of faith that God has called us to live. We have seen that in our country and around the world this last year. So while scientists are looking for the antidote to the coronavirus, I want to give you tonight the antidote to fear. Because the fear of the coronavirus is more deadly to your spirit than the actual virus is to your flesh. And I say that the fear of the virus is more deadly than the actual virus is to your flesh because fear and faith cannot coexist together. We will either be fear-filled or faith-filled. And what I want to do today is speak into this crisis from a Christ perspective. As followers of Christ, I want us to see three things tonight. What do we do? What will we see? And as Christ followers, how do we respond? First, what do we do? Number one, write this down. We look to Jesus. If you've ever seen a suspenseful movie or have read a thriller of a book, then you know 
The next time you watch that movie or read that book, it's not nearly as suspenseful and doesn't cause us nearly as much anxiety because you know how the story ends. You've seen the last scene of the movie. You've read the last page of the book. And you know it's all going to work out. The same is true for the Christian life. When we realize how the story ends and how it's all going to work out, the problems that would normally cause us anxiety or the situations that would normally have power over us or the questions that we would normally cause us perplexity no longer seem to affect you and me. Why? Because we know how the story ends. The answers are in the back of the book. So I want to invite you tonight to flip to the back of the book, the book of Revelation. Because in the time in which we live, it's easy to be filled with worry and anxiety and perplexity about what in the world is going on until you remember how the story ends. You see, the book of Revelation is a prophetic book with information of what's going to take place at the end of the world. And I love how this book starts. Let's take a look. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. We're just going to be looking at the first 28 chapters tonight. No, I'm kidding. Happy New Year. I just want to look at this first verse with you. It starts this way. The revelation of Jesus Christ. This book, the Bible, and the book of Revelation, its primary purpose is not that you would become a scholar in Bible prophecy primarily. It's that we would first, write this down, encounter Jesus personally. Because when we see Jesus, it changes how we view everything. You see, when you read the story of the book of Revelation, you realize that Jesus is on the throne, Jesus is coming back, and Jesus is going to take us home. And that's all that we need to navigate any problem. It helps us find the answer to any question. Jesus is on the throne. That means that he's in control, ultimately, of everything. Jesus is coming back. That means I want to live my life for him if he's coming back for me. And Jesus is going to take us home. I don't have to worry about what's happening in my life presently because I know where I'm going to land up ultimately. Do you remember when the disciples had their encounter with the resurrected Savior? The disciples were hidden in a room, doors locked, shutters closed. Blinds drawn. And now the disciples are hidden, sheltering in place, if you will. They're hiding in fear of their lives because they lost sight of Jesus. Jesus had been put to death, and they were in fear that the same thing would take place in their lives. So they were hiding. But something changed in those disciples, those closest followers of Jesus Christ. Something changed in their lives. You know what it was? They had an encounter with the resurrected Savior. They had a revelation of Jesus Christ. And my prayer for you is that we would have a New Year's revelation. More than we need a New Year's resolution. Because when you have a New Year's revelation, it changes everything in your life. These disciples went from hiding in fear in their homes to going and proclaiming who Jesus was to crowds of people that potentially could put them to death. What changed in their lives? They had an encounter with Jesus. And I bring this up because for many, we have so focused on the pandemic and the politics of 2020 that as Christians, we've lost sight of Jesus. 
We've taken our focus off of Jesus and we've put them on the things that are around us. The cares of this world. The things that are going on. And we need to refocus our vision. We need to place our focus on Jesus. Because in a time in which we live is a time in which the world needs the church the most. You see, we need to no longer be fearful, but we need to be faith-filled. The world needs the church, and so many times the church, the church, the body, the believers, stop being the church when the church is needed most. When the world outside of the church needs the body of Christ. You see, James chapter 5, verse 14 says, If there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. James didn't say, If anyone's sick and not contagious, we'll just anoint you with a six foot pole. But he said, when someone is going through something, here's where they are to turn. They're to turn to Jesus. When someone's going through something, that the power of prayer and anointing of oil, Jesus even reached out and touched lepers. He could have spoke healing to them because he told a blind man he could have sight without ever touching him, and he had sight. Jesus could have done the same with a leper, but he didn't. He touched that person. And we've lost something so important in the church. That is realizing the Lord is on the throne. We've taken our eyes off of Jesus. And listen, when the church isn't being the church and the church is absent, people's lives are destroyed. Brennan, it sounds like you're getting some news off some right-wing conspiracy theory website. CNN reports these headlines. In Japan, more people died from suicide last month than from COVID in all of 2020. The article goes on to say, in Japan, government statistics show suicide claimed more lives in the month of October than COVID-19 has the entire year to date. The monthly number of Japanese suicide rose to 2,153 in October, according to Japan's National Police Agency. As of Friday, Japan's total COVID-19 toll was 2,087, the health minister said. And Japan is one of the few major economies to disclose timely suicide data. Certain cities in Sacramento area won't even release data on their suicides right now for the state of California. But it's reported worldwide that suicide has claimed five times the amount of lives worldwide than COVID-19 has. Not to mention the damage and death from the increase of domestic violence, illicit drug abuse, prescription drug abuse, alcohol abuse, which has been far more deadly than the virus has been to begin with. And it's not just around the world, but it's in our own backyard. These headlines I saw last week, California elementary student commits suicide during Zoom distance learning class. And now experts are starting to warn that the pandemic could lead to a mental health crisis globally as mass employment, social isolation, and anxiety are taking their toll on people globally. And now we start to understand the importance of what God's word has to say for the church. The church that God has designed and established is essential. God has created the church for such a time as this. And the church is so much more than just a social gathering. For the word church in the Bible in the New Testament is a Greek word, ecclesia, which is defined this way. Gathering or grouping 
of the called out ones. God created it because he knows the importance of it. In our culture in the United States, I believe we've taken church much too lightly. Where it's become a family tradition or part of our religion or something that we just have done out of habit. In our convenient Christianity, we go to church when it fits in our schedule or when we don't have something else to do. It's something nice. They have good programs and comfortable chairs, air-conditioned building. And in the comfortability of church, we have lost the necessity of church. Because for us in the United States, church has never cost us anything. But around the world today and throughout history, people were willing to give their lives to be a part of it. Well, Brendan, isn't it dangerous right now to go to church? I'll let you do your own research and decide that, as I've done mine. But I will tell you this. It was much more dangerous to be a Christian in the early church, where they could be put to death, fed to lions, burnt at the stake, simply for gathering and worshiping and studying God's word. And that still didn't stop them. And it's still more dangerous around the world today as Christians are the number one persecuted group worldwide. More people die for their Christian faith than any other religious group combined. People are dying for their faith. And that still doesn't stop them from gathering together as the church. And I believe it's time for followers of Jesus to remember the church is essential. That following Jesus is essential. And it doesn't matter what political party you align yourself with or what media outlets you listen to. We first as Christians need to put the Bible as our primary authority in our lives. What does God's word tell me to do? Because that's what I'm going to listen to. Because Jesus Christ needs to be our authority. Well, Pastor Brennan, I could die. And I know that COVID has claimed lives. And I know other things claim lives too, and death is tragic. But there's something as a Christian that needs to reframe our perspective, and that's Psalms 139, verse 16. The psalmist declares, You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. The psalmist declares that every single one of my days has been written to the day before I ever lived. That means that nothing is going to take my life before God is done with me. And if God is done with me and he's ready to take me home, then so be it. I'm ready to go. But nothing will hinder the plans that God has. As long as I'm obedient to him, nothing is going to change that. But listen, I will no longer be silenced or be quiet as I've seen people struggle and hurt and die needlessly because the church is no more. We need to stop being filled with fear and put on and putting our focus on the virus. And we need to fix our eyes and focus on Jesus. Look to Jesus, look for Jesus, and look at Jesus. So what do we do? We look to Jesus. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Number two, that we would know, number two, Jesus is coming quickly. It goes on to say in verse one, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. 
You might say the events that will soon take place. Wait a minute. This was given 2,000 years ago and it said it would soon happen. Well, the word soon or shortly is the Greek word entaki. It's where we get the English word a tachometer. It's the gauge in your car that shows the RPMs when the engine is revving. And the word actually means that the actual translation is once these things come to pass or take place, talking about the events of the end times, it's going to happen fast with rapidity. When God says it's time, when the engine is revving, if you will, when things are warming up, Things are going to happen in succession with rapidity. It's going to take place fast. And when this pandemic started towards the beginning of this year, I remember on Monday, I was at a PF Chang's with Pastor Don McClure and my brother having lunch. And we started getting notifications on our phones that Disneyland just closed and these things just closed. And we were hearing about all these things on Monday that could possibly happen. By Friday, it already took place. And it happened with such rapidity where everything changed. If you remember that far back, everything happened so quickly and it set things in motion that I believe that God is allowing to set the stage of his return, the rapture of the church, the tribulation, and Christ's second coming. I hope that you realize tonight that the stage has been set for the Lord's return in two ways. First, prophetically, speaking of the last thing that needed to take place in Bible prophecy before the prophecy of the Lord's return, or the rapture of the church, I should say, was that Israel would become a nation, and that was fulfilled back in May 12th of 1948. Once that took place, everything that said would be done before the return of Jesus has taken place. So prophetically, the stage has been set but the Lord hasn't come back since 1948, I believe, because the stage hadn't yet been set practically. Practically, things had to be set in place. Well, what what are we seeing practically today? Well, we're seeing a technological society. You know, growing up in church, hearing my whole life, talking about the end times, what seemed like a science fiction movie. My pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith, talking about a chip that will be so small they'll be able to inject into your hand or into your forehead, which seemed crazy at the time. Now, today, thousands of Swedish citizens have been microchipped in their hands. The technology is there practically and is in commonplace in many other countries. Not only are we there practically in a technological society, but we're also now a cashless society. I had the privilege of traveling a few times during this year, and I'll never forget when I got on the plane. I won't say what airline it was, but it talked about the one world alliance that this airline was a part of. And I literally thought I was reading something out of the Jerry B. Jenkins Left Behind books. It literally said, welcome to the One World Global Alliance, now a cash-free environment. No longer taking cash on the planes, we'll accept alternative forms of payment. I'm like, nee, 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 this is the twilight zone. What is going on? But now it's commonplace. Well, the catalyst for that was the pandemic. Because money could be contaminated. I'll never forget, I saw this woman that had her husband very mad at her because she started to film all of this money, thousands upon thousands of dollars that she tried to self-sterilize by heating in her oven. (laughs) Because once it got to a certain temperature, she was told that the virus would die, but she didn't realize her money was paper and it would burn. And she had laid out all of these bills upon upon her counter of burnt to the crisp money. 
and people are so freaked out about the contamination of money that now there's been catalyst into society a non-contact payment system. Also, we see a coin shortage. I don't know if you've noticed that going to different places. Oh, there's a coin shortage. Well, where did all the coins go? They just disappeared all of a sudden? All of a sudden, there's not enough coins? Don't exchange cash because it contains the virus, not safe. Contactless payments is the way to go. And you start to see the things happen in rapidity, in succession, quickly setting the stage for what I believe we are drawing very, very near to. Not only a cashless society, but also a worldwide currency. This year, the U.S. Treasury Treasury Secretary let it slip that he was quite open to the idea of an eventual move towards a global currency run by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. There's been a globalist movement pushing towards a one world currency that has been going on for over a decade. But what's missing is a catalyst for cause. What would propel a simultaneous agreement around the world to get rid of money, country's currency, and to join a global one world currency? How about a worldwide virus? You see, in order for the Antichrist to control all buying and selling, there will have to be one currency. And that seemed to be an impossibility to economists for that to take place when one country suffers economically, another country benefits. If you don't understand how that works, you can just read a book on global economics. And there was never a need or an understanding of that because if one country went down, another country grows financially and it balances out. But this past year, we saw for the very first time in modern day world history, a worldwide economic collapse. And so we're seeing the coronavirus be a catalyst, a push towards a one world currency. Now whether that was enough or not, in the future you're understanding how the stage is being set where people won't bat an eye when it actually comes to take place the things that the Bible had predicted thousands of years ago. And as we see the first time in world history, we're seeing things being set practically. The stage was set prophetically in 1948, but practically this year, fast forwarding through 2020, has set the stage in every single area practically for the priming and readying of people for what would take place during the time in Revelation chapter 6 through 19 called the tribulation. So it's obvious to me that things are being set up and the foundation is being laid and everything's in place so it won't be thought of as weird or strange. But society now today looks at these things as normal. So what do you do as a follower of Christ? We look to Jesus. Why? So that we would know Jesus is coming quickly. And if Jesus is coming quickly, the number three, how do we respond? Don't tune out for this. Please hear me on this. Number three, we live by faith, not by fear. Since when have we allowed the world to frame and form our decision-making process? As followers of Christ, when have we allowed the world to dictate how we should think and act? Our filter is not the same as the world's. The filter that forms our decisions is different from the world because the Bible, the Word of God, is our filter. So we are not like this world. In fact, speaking of the word not, the title of this message, not afraid. Going off of the word not, we are not of this world. We're not to be conformed to this world. 
We are not like everyone else in this world because we do not live like those who have no hope of the world. And because the title of my message is Not Afraid, the reason why is because the antidote to fear is faith. When Jesus was comforting his disciples in John chapter 14, he said in John chapter 14, verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Then he goes on to say in verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you, give to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe or have faith in God, have faith in Jesus. And when you do, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. God doesn't give to us as the world gives, he declared. What the world is giving in 2020 is fear. Fear of the unknown, the fear that rules all fears, the greatest fear that there is, uncertainty. But God doesn't give to us what the world gives, no. God says, let not our hearts be troubled, and for us not to be afraid. I like how the New Living Translation translates Jesus' words. In John 14, 27, in the NLT, it says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. The peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So do not be troubled or afraid. When the rest of the world is in fear and worry, we can open up the gift of peace of mind and heart. It's peace that the world doesn't understand because it surpasses understanding. And I hope you understand, as we went into 2020, not expecting the year to go as it did, I hope you understand God's not in heaven thinking, oh no, I didn't see that one coming. What am I gonna do now? Apparently there's a global pandemic. Our God is still in control. Our God is always faithful. Our God is always good. Our God has a plan. Our God won't leave us, nor will he forsake us. Our God is working all things together for good in everything, everywhere. Our God is for you, and if God is for you, then who can be against you? The answer is nothing. And that's why as a Christian, the fear of the unknown is conquered by what, not by what you know, but by who you know. We live by faith because we know Jesus Christ. Speaking of not, Paul said in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So we are not panicking, but we have the peace of God. We are not fearful, for we have faith in the presence of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we live by faith, not by sight. Acts 2, 46, every day the early church continued to meet together in the temple courts They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. The early church, they met publicly, and they did this when Christians were being dragged out of their homes, thrown to lions, dipped in hot wax, and burnt as candles in Nero's garden. But they didn't let fear of the unknown control them but they put a huge emphasis on gathering together to worship and glorify God. It's not that they didn't care about 
the potential and real dangers. It's just that worshiping Jesus was more important. It was that Christ and what he called them to do was the primary purpose of their lives. The church has always been a spiritual refuge for people who are hurting. If there's ever a time that the world needs the church, it's now. That's why I'm so proud of Pastor David for taking the stand when he did. Although now the Supreme Court ruled that the rules and dictations against the church meeting in person was unconstitutional and thankful that two weeks ago the ruling passed that churches can meet once again legally. But even before that, a pastor that took a stand, knowing the importance of the ecclesia, the church. The church is more than just listening to a message. It's people coming together, joining together as the body of Christ. A.W. Tozer said this, and I quote, a scared world needs a fearless church. That's why we as a church need to be faith-filled and not fearful, not afraid. And if you look up the Bible verses in the New Testament that features the word not, I wanna just close with this. Because from the beginning of Jesus' life, when an angel appeared to those shepherds, the angel said, do not be afraid, for we bring you good news and great joy. When Jesus, saying why he came to the world, he said, I did not come for the healthy, but for the sick. Not for the righteous, but for the sinners. And because we today are not of this world, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Jesus does not lead us into temptation, but he deliver us from evil. Therefore, we do not store up for ourselves treasure on earth, but store up in heaven. Do not worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We walk by faith, not by sight. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Like Jesus, not my will be done, but yours. We are saved by grace, not by works. Justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law. And God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation. Therefore, we do not set our minds on earthly things, like what we read in social media or what we hear or watch on the news. No, we set our mind on things above. Let perseverance finish its work, not lacking anything. And do not become weary in doing good because we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Will it be a battle? Yes. But we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and powers of this world. And we will not be overcome with evil. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And we will overcome evil with good. We do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and are saved. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. We will not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. We will not give up meeting together because the Lord is our helper. We will not be afraid. Not ashamed of the gospel or the name of Jesus or the power of the gospel because it's the gospel that brings salvation to everyone. And like the first century believers in the book of Acts, they could not Stop talking about what they've seen and what they've heard. 
And like them, we cannot stop worshiping. We cannot stop giving. We cannot stop serving. We cannot stop attending because we know Jesus. And we are told not to be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and petition to make our requests known to God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We are different from this world because we are not of this world. The minds are not conformed to this world. We live by faith, not by fear. We are sacrificial, not selfish. We shine the light. We do not hide it. In closing, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed because of who he is, because of what he has done, because of his power, because of his grace, because of his presence that will never leave us nor forsake us. We, church, are not afraid because Jesus is with us. He goes before us and he's behind us. Who are we? We are the body of Christ. And that's why we fear nothing. Church, 2020 before us, much uncertainty of the future, but we don't have to know the future. We have to know the one who holds the future in his hands. We serve God Almighty and nothing else. So fix your eyes on Jesus and stop looking at everything else that's happening around you. Follow him. Be obedient to him. And I can guarantee you pursue Jesus like you've never pursued him before. No longer controlled by your fear, but having faith in Jesus. You're going to have the greatest year of your life. You can take that one to the bank. I guarantee it because God's word will not return void. Make 2021 the best year of your life. When the world is afraid of everything, fear nothing, for the Lord is our help and our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, we understand the reality of the things that we face. But God, we understand also that everything changes when we put our eyes on you when we realize you're in control, when we realize that nothing can happen in our lives that you don't allow, nothing happens by chance nor by accident, but whatever you allow into our lives, it's because you have a plan and a purpose that you're accomplishing as long as we're walking obediently to you. Nothing happens by chance nor by accident. But Lord, we understand tonight as we've refocused our eyes upon you, that we need to have faith in you, that what your word says is true. Forgive us, Lord, if we've been filled with fear or if we've allowed fear to dictate our obedience to you. For you are on the throne, you are in control, and you also desire to be the authority of our lives. Not because you need to be, but because we need you to be. And Father, I ask for each and every single one of these, my family members, that you would help us to not be afraid, but be filled with faith in what your word says and that we would trust in you. For you have a plan and a purpose, and you promise to work all things together for good. 
even when we don't see it, we still believe it because we walk by faith, not by sight. And as heads are clo- or eyes are closed and heads are bowed tonight, in this heart of prayer, whether you're watching this online right now or you're here in person, perhaps fear has had a hold on you. But you realize, as God's word declares, perfect love, which Jesus demonstrated on the cross for you, casts out all fear. Fear and faith can no longer exist together. And if there's been an overwhelming sense of fear in your life, I want to pray over you tonight that you would be set free from that fear and you would no longer be enslaved to fear, but you would be free to follow Christ in faith. Whether you've never given your life to Jesus Christ or you've walked with him for 30 years or 40 years, but you've allowed faith to control you instead, or fear to control you instead of your faith to control you, I want to pray for you tonight. Would you face your fears tonight? And would you let your fear know that there's no longer place for fear because you've been filled with faith? And if that's you tonight and you would like to be prayed over that you could leave the fear at the feet of Jesus tonight and go into this next year fearless because you've been faith-filled, I want you right now, wherever you're at, whether you're watching this at home or you're here in person, to stand to your feet. I want to pray for you that you could go boldly into 2021, proclaiming who Jesus is and being the example to the world that so desperately needs Jesus Christ. Because what the world needs now is to see Jesus. And Jesus is not afraid. And as his followers, we don't need to be either. As there's people standing all around this auditorium and Perhaps many standing in their own living rooms right now. God, we pray as we begin this next year that nothing would control us or dictate to us who we are or the way that we should live other than you and your word alone. God, knowing that you'll protect us and nothing will happen that isn't according to your will. And Lord, for those that have been controlled by their fear, I pray that you would break the chains of bondage of fear in their lives tonight. That you would set them free to live a life, a glorious life of faith. Forgive us, Lord, for taking our eyes off of you and putting them on the cares of the world, doing exactly what your word tells us not to do. So God, we refocus our perspective. We turn our eyes to you now. And we thank you, God, that you love us, that you forgive us, and you're willing to walk with us, carrying us on to completion. God, I pray that the world that's so filled with fear would see a church that's fearless and have the opportunity to see Christ in us. And Lord, I pray for the church that it wouldn't be convenient Christianity, but for each of us never taking for granted again the opportunity to be the church, Ecclesia, coming together as one. You created us not to do life alone, but to do life together. I pray for those, Lord, who physically can't. I pray that you would sustain them and be with them and encourage them. For those who have to be quarantining and not in contact with anyone, although no contact with any people, that they would realize they're never alone, for you are with them. For those who have had to stay at home because of physical ailments, Lord, be with them. 
but for Lord those that have chosen not to be a part of the church because of fear of the unknown we pray God that you would give us a new perspective eyes to see it the way that you see it and we thank you God that when we walk with you we don't have to worry about anything but in everything with prayer and supplication we make our requests known to you and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding would guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus God 2021 guard our hearts guard our minds and help us to live for you like we've never lived for you before If this is the year you're going to come back, Lord, help us to have a sense of urgency to be the church. What does it matter if you come back this year that we've made all of these changes and stopped being the church? But God, give us a sense of urgency to reach people like never before this upcoming year to invite people to church, to come and hear the gospel, the good news of salvation, to be a witness, to share with somebody. Give us eyes to see and hearts that feel for people who don't know you and that we would be the church that this world needs. In Jesus' name we pray, God help us, and we all gather together to say amen, amen. Let's all stand together. Paul the Apostle, when serving and doing ministry, was smitten by a serpent, a venomous snake. And those islanders knew the poison of that snake because they've seen what had happened to their family members when they were smitten by that same type of snake. They knew it was certain death if you got hit with that snake. But that didn't stop Paul from going and picking up sticks to lay on a fire to serve others when he himself had been shipwrecked, cold and wet. But he got up and desired to help others. And when he was helping others, He himself was smitten, but he took that snake and he shook it off into the fire. And it says in the book of Acts that he was not harmed. We don't have to worry about the cares of this world because our God is greater than the cares of this world. Our God is greater than the coronavirus. Our God is greater than cancer. Our God is greater than everything. If it's our time to go, then God, take us home. We want to be with you. And God, if it's not, as Paul would say, to live as Christ, to die is gain. Whether we go to heaven or we live on earth, Lord, help us to live for you and you alone that God would reframe our perspective in the way that we view everything because we do not live for ourselves. We live for Jesus and Him alone. 2021, live for Jesus. Serve Him with your life. Pursue Him like you've never pursued Him before and watch how God will draw near to you. Watch how God will do through you what you never knew He could do before. Watch how God will make an uncertain year certain in the fact that Jesus Christ is on the throne. Live for him, love him, and watch what he will do. 2021 is gonna be a great year by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.